grad student. Welcome to part one of this giant episode all about being disabled in grad school. Part two will be released this Thursday, December 10th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you think this episode has hot takes, just wait till Thursday. Anyways, today's episode is all about burning down the system, uh, I mean, uh, being disabled in grad school and ableism with the wonderful grad students who run the at dis in grad school Twitter account, sixth year biological sciences PhD candidate Kate Kirby, and second year developmental psychology PhD student Caden Stockwell. Hello listeners, welcome back to Dear Grad Student, the podcast where grad students can come together to celebrate, commiserate, and support one another through this long and difficult journey. I'm Alana, I'm a fourth year doctoral student and your host, and I'm joined today by sixth year PhD candidate studying mitochondrial DNA and C. elegans, Kate Kirby, and second year PhD student studying autistic social interactions and perceptions of autistic people, Caden Stockwell. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm excited for this episode. Me too. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for reaching out about this. We'll get to that in a second. Um, But as always, I like to start my episodes shouting you guys out on social media. So if you, I don't know who wants to go first, but if you want to give your personal accounts, if you want, and the group account that you guys run, go ahead and shout those out. Where can they find you online? Um, so we run a, um, group account together, um, on Twitter that's called disabled in grad school. And the handle for that is at this in grad school. And you can find both of our handles in the bio on that account. But then my personal account, um, is Kate S Kirby on Twitter, Um, And I also have a website where I post uh, resources for teaching and learning that are available for free to anyone. Amazing. Do you want to go ahead and spell your personal handle as well? Oh, yes. Um, So my personal handle is C-A-I-T-S-K-I-R-B-Y. Perfect. And Caden, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, You can find me on my uh, personal account at Caden Stockwell. K-A-Y-D-E-N-S-T-O-C-K-W-E-L-L. Perfect. So everybody listening, go ahead and give them a follow as I know you all will, but don't worry if you're not yet convinced about 50 minutes from now, we're going to do it again. So if you if you didn't catch that, don't rewind. Just wait 50 minutes. It'll come again at the end. Uh, but <laughs> today's topic is all about being disabled in grad school and experiencing ableism really every step of the way. Now, Y'all approached me about doing this episode, and I know the answer to the question that I'm about to ask, but I would love if we started with why this episode or this kind of episode is important or relevant. You know, why did you guys want to come and chat with me about this today? So on Twitter, there is a a good-sized and ever-growing sort of disability community, Um, and within that, there is a a sort of sub-community of disabled grad students But at least for me, like outside of the internet, I didn't know other disabled grad students in my cohort or in my program. Um, And so it was really sort of looking to find that community in any place we could for disabled grad students, but then also sort of bring awareness to the fact that disabled people are present in grad school and in the academy um, at large um, for people who don't have disabilities to sort of give some insight into. our experiences and the barriers um, that we face. Yeah, I think one big um, reason why we wanted to start that account, but then also why we uh, reached out after we had started the account was that there is some research that there are maybe about 20% of undergrad students are disabled, but then only around 8% of grad students, and then only around 4% of faculty. And so there's this big drop off that there's a much higher uh, percentage of undergrads than grad students and then faculty. And so we um, recognize that a lot of the barriers that Caden was just alluding to are sort of preventing that transition from undergrad to grad school. And then I've read of varying rates of, of dropout 
from graduate school for all students. I've I've uh, read that it sometimes approaches like the 40 to 50% range. Whoa. Yeah, that there's a huge rate of, of attrition and that that is likely higher for disabled grad students. And so that's probably why we don't have as high a rate of disabled faculty is that there are all these barriers to getting into grad school, to persisting through grad school and then making it into the faculty um, and so we really wanted to be able to come here and kind of talk about, uh, again, as Caden mentioned, these barriers to maybe help abled uh, peers understand the role that they can play in sort of normalizing disability um, and helping their disabled peers persist through um, to help diversify the faculty. Yeah. Wow. So that was like an amazing description that I feel like you've hit every point of what we're going to go over today. I'm like, you did a better job than I would ever do describing any of my episodes. I'm so glad to have both of you here to chat about this. I think that it's it's really clear that you're both expert on it, um, both in, in your experience, but also just in your sort of like advocacy work. Like it seems like based on the way that you described that, it's very clear to me in the 30 seconds or however long that was why this is necessary. And I already knew it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have you here because I would have been like, I don't get it. I get it. <laughs> but also that was a really sort of like shocking description in terms of the mm. stats that you mentioned. I admittedly like didn't even run through my mind like what percentage of grad students are disabled. And the fact that there is that drop off just seems like a major problem. You know, as I've talked in previous episodes, like when we talk about representation, right? Mm. So like with that drop off, not only is that a a bad thing at the level that it's a bad thing, but it also means that if you have 4% of faculty or who are disabled, right, that contributes like in the cycle of, well, yeah, undergrads aren't seeing themselves in faculty, exactly. which I, as I know we're going to get to also contributes to the fact that the like insane amount. <laughs> You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, after recording the episode, Kate and Caden provided really important feedback for me about certain language that I used while we were recording. And turns out the word insane is not a neutral phrase. Because of its historical use as a derogatory term for people with mental health diagnoses or to invalidate women's emotional reactions or just for generally increasing the stigma around mental health, it's been labeled by many as an ableist term, meaning that we really shouldn't use it anymore. And frankly, there are about 1,000 other ways to describe situations than the word insane. Um, and I'd also probably add the word crazy to that list. So I definitely messed up here. I'll probably catch myself doing this in future episodes and I'll keep trying to work on it, but just thought I would let you know. All right, back to the episode. I was just talking about the large, huge, immense amount of ableism. Of ableism in terms of like accommodations and things like that is such a hard roadblock uh, because people aren't listening because they don't, they don't see it themselves, right? Faculty aren't seeing other faculty. They are not getting it. And on top of that, like some disabilities are not as visible. Yeah. And so there's an issue there as well about it, you know, almost like disability erasure, right? Where it's like, oh, well, if I can't see it, it's not happening to you. Uh, and I think that to me has been one of the biggest eye openers in the last year or two that I have realized, um, you know, I hear a lot about like medical conditions that you don't see, um, which in some cases are, in some cases are not disabilities, but I just never thought about it in terms of more broadly like disabled and what that really means. So yeah, those numbers just really hit me. Well, and, and on that, it kind of brings up the question of how are we getting these numbers? Mm. And so, and so Sometimes these numbers are actually just taken from people who are registered with whatever Office of Disability Services is on campus or who gets accommodations. Um, and so we know that a lot of grad students just don't even register. And as we'll talk about, I'm sure, um, it's because like getting accommodations in grad school is really challenging. It's really hard. It's expensive. It's expensive. It's, it's not as easy, which... Uh, I mean, it's almost never easy, yeah. <laughs> but the accommodations that grad students need are usually not what's sort of on the menu of accommodations in, in the offices of, of, of disability services. But further than we talked about how there are so few faculty members, but faculty members have a really um, challenging time with stigma and maybe they're hiding their, mm. their, disabilities from 
their offices on campus. And so we actually aren't 100% sure about what that picture looks like because, there, because, because it is really hard to quantify that. Yeah. Wow. And, and even as I'm thinking about that too, right, I've talked on so many episodes about like, In academia, there is this unspoken, like, just push through it. This is supposed to be hard, just, and like, at some level, yeah, like, this is challenging. That's like an objective (laughs) description of grad school. It should be challenging, but it shouldn't be inaccessible. And so I think that the line between challenging and inaccessible is really, really important. And I think that many abled students and faculty, and I will include myself in that group because this is something that, especially over the last, like I said, year or two years is really coming to light. So I'm not going to act like I'm above it. I'm past it. I'm sure I make tons of assumptions, but I think that this is something that when we have this built in, this should be hard, push through it, just get over it. Um, When somebody asks for an accommodation, whether you like it or not, your bias is why aren't you strong enough to, why can't you just, and that needs to shift for me and for others. It has nothing to do with willpower at all. And I think that that has been a mental shift for me that I'm very purposely making because I mean, they're like, they're perpendicular. They're not related. Yeah. Yeah. I would also love to hear how you guys met because I know you're at different universities and really also how the Twitter account came to be because I think it sounds very clear from your description of like why it exists, but why did you two feel like we want to be people running an account like that? Um, why was it important for both of you? Yeah, um, I mean, we met, met on the internet because like you said, we, we go to different different universities. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Internet <laughs> friendships are the best. They are, they are, they are fun. But um, (laughs) yeah, we sort of met in this, you know, the disability Twitter community and then sort of disability in like education sort of sphere. And so we we were both interested in like creating a space that was focused on like actionable things that people could do at their own like local communities or their local or their their own institution. Um, And so the um, the Department of Labor, right? does um, October, does National Disability Employment Awareness Month um, to try and increase awareness and increase hiring of um, disabled people in a variety of sectors. And so we figure, you know, our world is grad school um, and there are disabled grad students. So what can we do to make grad school more accessible? Um, Can we talk about sort of illuminate some of the barriers that are there? And then can we sort of provide actionable items that people can do to try and make um, their own institutions more accessible. Yeah. And I know that, you know, for those of you listening, you want to hear some behind the scenes, we tried to make an October episode work. (laughs) And by the time we were in chat, like chatting about it, I had all my October episodes recorded. I was drowning in schoolwork and I was like, the soonest I can do is December. Can we do? And so we're making it work, but certainly in future Octobers going forward, you know, this episode will continue to be shouted out. And I know that you guys had a whole sort of like daily hashtag event. I would love to hear a little bit about how that went. I, I did follow along with it. Uh, I tried to re- retweet as much as I saw things come up, but I was admittedly not on Twitter as often as I would have liked just because <laughs> October and November during this squished yeah. COVID semester. Oh boy. Uh, so I would love to talk a little bit about like how that went, uh, what you learned from it. You know, I saw a couple different accounts doing it and it was just really powerful. Hey, it's Alana from the future. So after recording, Kate and Kaden decided that in addition to linking some of the accounts in the show notes, they also want to give a shout out on air. So here is a clip of Kate doing that now. So we want to highlight the important parallel work that the Twitter account Dis in Higher Ed did in October as well. And so you can find them on Twitter at Dis in Higher Ed, which is D I S. I-N-H-I-G-H-E-R-E-D. And you can follow their hashtag from October, which was hashtag D-E-H-E-M. There are also many other Twitter accounts that are doing great things too. And we've linked them in the show notes. So please check them out and follow along to hear all about disability and specifically disability in grad school, higher ed, and academia. Thanks, Kate. Okay, back to the episode. I think it really helped my own awareness in terms of my actions, my biases, and things that I need to work on going forward, for sure. 
Yeah, well, so as Caden mentioned, we were kind of like piggybacking off of the Department of Labor, the Department of Labor's NDEAM, but we found that a lot of their takes were a little questionable. That we mm. didn't really agree with some of the uh, like uh, narratives that they were putting forth. We didn't really agree with some of the framings of things and so um we we wanted to sort of take the like bare bones structure framework of what they had and then uh, fill it in with maybe slightly more disability positivity I would say more um like embracing disability instead of just trying to sort of overcome Mm -hmm. um which was kind of prevalent in their takes um and we also wanted to specifically tailor it to graduate school and so there's quite a bit of research now into the experiences of disabled undergrads this year actually i think three books came out about the experiences of disabled faculty members and um and academic ableism, but there is no research about the experiences of disabled grad students. Mm. There is just, I don't know if there isn't funding for it or there's not interest in it. I have no idea. But so we we sort of recognized that that there was this kind of niche that wasn't being filled um, and that we have experienced our own struggles and challenges. And so we thought that we could kind of carve out this space um, to really focus in on this kind of unspoken experience. But we also uh, recognize that we, we, our experiences are not the one disability experience because there's not one experience, right? Um, And we both are uh, white people. And so we don't experience the intersection of uh, 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 racism and ableism. Um, and so we uh, we both kind of come from the experiences that we come from with the privileges that we are afforded, but we still thought that we could kind of use the account to, yeah, p- promote the, the, these very actionable items. We wrote um, like email templates to have people email their director of graduate studies or the chair of the department or whoever. Um, but I think the most informative thing that we did was um, all these polls. And so um, most of the time we ran some sort of a poll to sort of collect a little bit of information about other people's experiences mm. based on on our own. And I think having some concrete numbers, because again, no one's really doing research yeah, we about don't know this. anything. <laughs> we don't really have any numbers on anything. Right. And so that that was kind of where the polling came in. Um, and we can talk about uh, maybe some of the interesting or shocking or really negative <laughs> um, answers that we got um, and how that might inform us going forward. I find that to be so extremely useful. Like as you're talking about like the research of disabled students in grad school, not really being a thing, you know, I think a lot with my background being in psychology and specifically clinical psychology, I do assessments at my university's um, like psychology clinic run by our department. Um, And I thought I would just drop a few numbers because I was actually thinking about this as you were talking, as we're talking even about like accessibility of Mm. the services to get accessibility services. Yeah. You know, at our clinic, we do assessments for things like ADHD. Um, We don't support autism assessments, just we don't have somebody who can supervise that. So like legally, we just don't. But it's mostly like ADHD or like a learning disability that we're able to assess for. And we have discounts for students. And that price is $450 for one assessment. Now Uh it is a fully comprehensive assessment. So it, it like does a full, we check for a million things. We do eight hours of testing, which also like, let's talk about accessibility, but that's fine. Um, but we do like eight hours of, of testing and we really, you know, either screen out or find out multiple things, but we don't work with insurance. So if people have insurance, mm. we can give them anything to get reimbursement, but we don't do that. So that makes it a little bit less accessible. And the other thing we're hearing $450, like, wow, that's so expensive. We're the cheapest in our area. Wow. We are most accessible and we're 400. <laughs> and this is not me dissing my department because, you know, at some level, like we're not funded by the university. So we only are funded. And you know, our therapy services, I've said before, like some people pay five or $10 for a therapy session. So it really is quite accessible when you compare it. But if you're yeah. not comparing it and you're just looking at it, like 
that is a lot of money. It is. And the other thing that you had me thinking of as we're talking about numbers that came from your polls, I think it would also be really useful just as we're about to really deep dive, really from either of you, if we could somehow define what disabled Mm. is, who are we talking about? Um, I think the reason I'm asking this to be defined, it, this is a bigger word than I ever really realized. Mm. Not only that, this is not a bad word. Mm. I think that, you know, we hear things like special needs. We, we've seen the memes, <laughs> for those of you on academic Twitter, of people who are like, they go through the list of like the things that they've heard themselves be called and they're like, I'm just disabled. Yeah. Like, just call it that. So yeah. what, who are disabled people? Like, what does disabled mean? Who are we talking about? So... We're not going to give you an easy answer. <laughs> no, I don't listen. I don't want an easy answer. I we can just like play with a working definition because I and I think it's like exactly that. Like for yeah. for you both being in the disabled community, I feel like there's a mental concept of like, yeah, I get it, but could I verbalize it? No. <laughs> but yeah, give it your best shot. Give me your not easy answer. I'm here for it. I'm ready. So yeah, we we thought about it and our. My, my at least general stance is that any written definition you find is probably going to be limiting and exclusionary to some people. And one of the big problems that is that you'll find is that a lot of the times these definitions, especially as you get into like, quote unquote, official ones by like government agencies mm. are generally created by able people. Not always, but generally. And so sometimes like formal definitions can be useful to like start a conversation if someone has like no background in what disability is. But I think like once you sort of maybe give that initial formal definition to like start a conversation, it helps to kind of just like like go into the the butt or the critiques of here's why this is limiting or not exactly the end all be all. Yeah, it's tough. Kate, do you have anything to add in that definition of it's everyone, but not everyone? (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I think thinking about the information that you just shared about testing, I think that's a really great example of why our definition is too uh, limiting, is that with testing, we basically have decided that some assessor, whether it's a doctor or it's whoever's at this clinic has the power to decide, right? We are putting the power of the, of the decision about disability into the hands of some person. Um, and then access to that person can be limited based on geography or based on time or based on money. Um, but also the assessor has biases and the, um, the metrics that we use can be really biased um, based on who they were, who the original doctors were assessing when they designed the assessment and what biases we have about individuals. And so often when people are trying to get diagnosed, their diagnosis can come down to whether or not the doctor perceives them as being like a reliable narrator. And so if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, if you're poor, um, the doctor just might think that you don't know enough, that you're not educated enough, that you don't fall into the right category to be a reliable narrator. And so you're probably hysterical or you're lying or you just don't understand what's going on. So all of that makes it so so that oftentimes people don't get diagnosed when they really should be. Um, And so having a very medicalized definition, which is the one that happens at these assessments for accommodations, um, they're the ones that the governmental organizations use to give you benefits or to help you get the care that you need um, using these really medicalized uh, models are real um, can be really harmful. Um, and so there's this other model that's sort of more like a social model of disability. And there are a number of, of models. Sure. Um, the, the predominant one that oftentimes we are socialized into is that medical one. Yeah. But oftentimes folks in the the disability community also kind of think through this social model um, in which we 
think um, more about uh, disabled people as being disabled by the society, by all all these barriers. Um, And so I don't know if any of that was helpful in coming more towards a definition, but I think it just gives you like a little bit of context. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, you know, I, I should have caveated when I started that like, I, <laughs> I did know going in that like, there's not a good definition. And I think Kaden, yeah. you bring such a, a good point that almost all like, I, I want to quote unquote, call it official here, but like governmental or institutional definitions are created by abled people looking yeah. to try to define this other to themselves. They're looking to put it in a box because they don't understand it. And as somebody coming from clinical psychology, I hear a lot about this medical model that you talk about, Kate. It's interesting because from a clinical psychology standpoint, we do a lot of things different than the classic medical model of things in treatment of psychological disorders or what have you. Now, in the assessment of it, you just made me really think about like how do we do it? And in the program I'm currently in, we really have a clinical science focus, which is a, a heavily evidence-based and less clinical judgment of like, what do I think? Oh, that's valid if I think that as an expert. We really, we move away from the expert model. We try to really be a lot more, there's a word here, collaborative. There it is. And it it still got me thinking. Now, I don't know this because not all disabilities are visible. I don't know in off the top of my head if I can think of a disabled grad student in my program. Not to say that there aren't any, but in terms of what I'm currently aware of, I don't know. And yet we are making these, these judgments or, you know, judgments based on sure valid measures of whatever, but what does valid mean when you think about how they're created and who created them? And yes, it's, yes. it's a really good point to bring up. And something that you also made me think of, um, is this word enough? Mm. I am not a disabled person. Uh, I do have some different intersectional identities. One I've talked about on the podcast is that I'm bisexual and I've always been in a heterosexual relationship. And I've had this in my mind in terms of just thinking about an identity thing of, Part of the reason I hadn't come out for many years was like, well, I'm not bisexual enough because I don't mm. have quote unquote proof. People can't see it. I'm not, you know, I'm very cis gendered as well. So there's nothing about me visibly that someone would say she's not heterosexual. The reason I bring up this comparison is to, to say that there's also something to be said about when we're assessing for any kind of ability that, oh, you know, they're right on the borderline. They're not quite X or Y or Z enough for us to call it this. And that has me feeling angry as we're talking (laughs) that I'm like, that is erasure. I mean, like, I know I brought it up before, but I've, I'm making this connection live (laughs) as we're recording, (laughs) um, really to my own work of it's very dismissive. It can Mm. be very dismissive. You know, I have seen, there have been times when like we give a diagnosis of something and it's very affirming. Those are good feel times to be like, yes, this is, this describes like there are also other people who experiences that, that you can connect with and it can be very affirming. But on the other side, when it's like, no, you don't have this thing, it mm. can leave people very, feeling very lost of like, well, how do I explain what's going on? Because I'm having difficulties with something or I'm having things that I have more barriers than I notice other people have. So what do I do then? I don't know. I don't even know if I have anywhere to go with this comment is just to say that like you, once again, if I say this a million times, my wheels are turning which I think is valuable. It's just, it's really interesting. Yeah, I think you make a good point because in that sort of, uh, like the clinical class classifications of, you know, do you have quote unquote, like enough of the D- of the DSM, the diagnostic criteria to get this diagnosis can be the line between whether somebody then has access to services or to accommodations at their university yeah. or whether, you know, there's an acknowledgement that you're struggling, but because you're not quote unquote struggling enough, we can't help you, or at least not in any formal setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll say too, you know, without, there's going to be no HIPAA violating here, but just to say that (laughs) in any ADHD diagnosis I have given, um, anytime that there's a borderline, me personally, I usually come to my supervisor with the argument of if they're on the borderline, there's enough that I don't want to, I don't want to be me, a 24, 25 year old student in training, don't want to be the reason that this person can't get accommodations for their college career onward. Like I, I have no right to make that call. And so if we're saying there's enough going on that we're wondering, who am I to say, you know? So I usually like to lean on the side of, yeah, let's write the damn letter. What effort is going to take me, what, 
15 minutes to fill out our form letter with their information and send it off. And then I never think about it again, but it gets to change their entire college experience and perhaps mental health and life. Yeah. I'm going to spend 15 minutes and (laughs) make that call. So that's where I like to lean. And I think my clinic does as well. Although I really am not and cannot speak for them (laughs) for liability (laughs) reasons, but for my impression, that is how, you know, but that's not everywhere and that's not every clinic. And that's not everyone's bias, you know? So I like to err on the side of, you know, quote unquote caution with it, but that that is not how everyone leans. I can tell you that from what I've seen on Twitter on the outside of the disabled community for sure. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I relate a lot to your um, anecdote and like, like relating the enoughness. I think it's also very true with individuals who have like chronic illnesses or they have fluctuating disabilities that um, you might have an illness or a a disability that is enough on the day before you get tested, (laughs) but then is not quote unquote enough uh, when you actually are tested. And, and where I really hope that maybe we can have your wheels turned to and you can, yeah, is is like <laughs> is like like the, the the realization that if somebody's on the borderline that you might be preventing a person from getting accommodations. I would argue that having anybody in a position to make any decision is actually like a barrier, right? Mm-hmm. And and so often in the in the disability community and the movement there is, um, and I mean, it's been around for a while now. Um, there's this concept of universal design, which is basically just designing things and planning things to make them accessible to the greatest number of uh, uh, people based on size and age and ability and race and gender and everything. And, and there's like a more specific part of it. That's about universal design for learning where you basically make all of your uh, materials accessible to everyone in all formats and you provide choice of engagement. Um, And I think if we can move towards that model where you don't even need to give somebody accommodations because you have created everything for them that is already accommodating, I think that would then... mm, no longer position anybody to be the person who grants yeah. or permits people to have access via these assessments and 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 uh, medicalizing and pathologizing um, procedures. You know, and you, I don't often swear on this show, but I am going to drop a swear word here because <laughs> being a grantor, as we'll as we'll call, it feels f-ing weird. I have no yeah. right. Yeah, that yeah. is kind of how I feel. It is a very, and I'll just be straight, it is a very uncomfortable position to be in because it kind of feels wrong. And I've always kind of felt that way where I'm like, "Mm -hmm, are we (laughs) looking at that? You know, and this is no, I'm not, you know, this is nothing on my supervisor. It's nothing on the train, nothing like that. This is the state of the world, but it is weird for me to be making a judgment on somebody. And I know that's the job. Like, (laughs) I know I did sign up for the job there, um, at least in some sense, but it is it's strange. And I think that when you when you talk about that, and I want to make sure we get back to these numbers you mentioned, because I'm sure that this might be wrapped up in this as well. But as we think about the pros and cons of COVID, mm. the things that we were seeing, that I was seeing, I should say, I say we, just like, I mean me. <laughs> I say this all the time where I'll say the word we, and then I'm like, I'm talking about myself. I'll say things like, oh yeah, we're dropping the episode. I'm like, we, like no one does this podcast with me. Like I'm, I am dropping this. I don't, I work alone. Um, but things that I was seeing in March about, you know, how, oh, and it's like, I'm feeling already angry as I'm about to say this, but like how quickly universities mm. were suddenly magically able to provide everything with online. And I'm like, I, and I was noticing this and I was, I didn't think anything of it until I pe- saw people online who were like, how many years have I petitioned my university to yeah. provide me this so that yeah. I could attend class if I couldn't physically make it to campus that day? A pandemic yeah. hits six days later, they have an entire infrastructure for the, you know, 50,000 students at my university. And suddenly, because the ableds need it, it's happening. And I yeah. had this and I'm, <laughs> I don't know, just got like sweaty because I, I all of a sudden <laughs> was like, holy shit, it is 2020. 
this has always, not always, you know, in the last 10 years, yeah, been yeah, yeah. possible. And I, I cannot imagine what kind, like how, I'm like trying to verbalize this, but like as a person, I would feel like not a single person gave a shit about me if that were me. I would feel kind of worthless and be like, they don't give, they don't care. I am nothing to this university. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that person is worthless. I'm saying if yeah, I yeah, were in yeah. that position, I would feel like there was no point. Why? And we always talk, talk about attrition. So when I say thinking about COVID, clearly universities have the infrastructure. Yeah. I don't know what the world will look like when things are back in person. I wonder, as you were speaking about making things available and accessible in all contexts, do we, this is a we, do we think <laughs> that this will be folded in to increase accessibility? I mean, what is the disabled community talking about, about like the effects that this could have positive or negative, do we think that universities are suddenly going to go back to like, <laughs> well, we only had the infrastructure then, but now we magically don't. I mean, what do you guys think? Like, <laughs> I'm just, I <laughs> didn't mean to make you laugh through that, but I'm glad I'm funny. I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And I think there's a lot of maybe fear of like, you know, eventually someday when things are safe to be in person, again, that there will just be this giant rollback of online learning because a lot of, at least professors that I know are not big fans of having to do the like recording of lectures and stuff. And so, um, I have so many feelings about that, but I'm going to yeah. hold it back. As um, keep talking. So yeah, I think there's a lot of fear <laughs> that there will be a lot of rollback once a vaccine is out or however this is, this moves forward. Um, and that this disabled people will sort of be back in the situation of, uh, your, your request for Zoom attendance of class is denied. It's not a reasonable accommodation or something. I know in some places I know for like non-university accommodations of like doctor's offices and telehealth visits have already, mm -hmm. um, for some people I know rolled back where they previously had been able to make appointments online and that functionality is now gone yeah. because... Okay, that doesn't even make sense to me because isn't that easier for doctors? You would think. Like, like as somebody who's doing therapy over telehealth, it is like, I mean, I could do it from the university and it would be just as easy of like, how much more accessible, don't even get me started on therapy accessibility to people, I can't get started, but yeah. like, oh, it's easier as a doctor to not like, if pe people are going to be late less often, people are probably more likely to attend if they get to do it from the comfort of their home. Not yeah. to mention like, when we think about doctors, I did not mean to cut you off, Kate, and I just like feel really, <laughs> as somebody who's worked in doctor's offices, like if somebody needs a five minute appointment just to get a refill on a prescription, like how much time it saves them or like they wouldn't have to take off work if they could do it from their lunch hour at their desk to be like yep still need this still fine bye exactly yeah. yeah exactly that happened oh. to me is i had a specialist appointment who's normally an hour and a half drive away from me and i could do it on my couch and it was literally a 15 minute appointment that was what it would have been if it was in person but i didn't have to commute i didn't have to take yeah. time off of doing things i i just like don't I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> I have a lot of feelings about this. And and I have feelings about this and I'm not being affected by it. I'll say that right here. I'm not having feelings because I'm affected. I'm having feelings because people need to get their shit together. It's dis it, dis it disgusts me. Honestly, I, that's, the, that's the emotion I feel. I feel disgusted. But I will add because... Nothing is ever so easy as, mm -hmm. as COVID has made access better for everyone because it hasn't, yes. uh, right? Um, there are actually tons of ways that COVID has reduced access. Yes. A lot of, like, as Caden mentioned, um, not all faculty are keen to have to do things online now and aren't really, there, there are some faculty who aren't really changing what they're doing to be online. And so they're still having just like multiple choice exams. Mm -hmm. And now they're just having students open the computer and have the the camera on and if their eyes move too much then they're accused of cheating or if they physically move too much then they're accused of cheating or if they talk to themselves then they're accused of cheating uh, and these are all things that that disabled students might do right i mean disabled students i mean abled students might too right yeah. um uh, 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 but this is a particular issue for d d disabled students who might move around a lot for, 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 uh, for their exams or who might speak the questions and their answers out loud as they're answering them. Uh, and never mind all the access issues of like having a computer with a camera and, and 
all of that, or having a quiet space where you're uh, by yourself and you don't have other family members or cats or whatever it is that um, might be moving around um, in your background. And so I actually wrote, uh, I co-authored a blog post about exactly this, about how, um, how COVID increased access for all students, which was kind of a slap in the face to disabled students, but how it's also like, it's not all great. There are, there are always going to be challenges and we have to make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. Anytime that we adapt, we need to be adapting for everybody, uh, not just the easiest people to adapt for. Yes. And I think that that's key, right? Is I think that within the abled community, it's the sense of like, oh, I get a gold star. I did this thing and I'm done. <laughs> uh, and that shouldn't be how it works. And, you know, as I'm thinking about this, you know, we're talking, we're talking about all students here as we've been talking. I would love to now finally, 20 minutes later, bring it back <laughs> to you. What are some of the things that you guys learned specifically about like grad student needs? Um, and what grad students are saying or what people in this higher education community are saying. I mean, even what came to mind as I was thinking is I was like, wow, I was thinking about how like quals for some people is like that eight hour sitting and typing thing. And I was like, well, that sucks for everybody. <laughs> Not to mention if that's an inaccessible way for you to demonstrate your knowledge. So that like that was one thing that came to mind that may or may not be in your polls, but I would love to hear some of these numbers that you said were like really kind of shocking as it talks about going forward, what kind of advocacy work you'll be doing. I think well, one point I'd like to make before oh, yeah. we jump directly into the numbers, Perfect. because I've I've now written it like three times oh, in our gosh. little notes because it keeps coming back up again, is is this concept that like rigor, that like academic rigor mm-hmm. is incompatible with accessibility, that we need to have this eight hour long typing qualifying exam, or for, for, for me, it was, I think like two hours standing up giving a talk and just being interrupted over and over again. And so like the the idea is that if we give you these accommodations, we're lessening the rigor. If we allow you to do your qualifying exam in three pieces, then are you achieving the same as the other grad students are? And I think that's just such a wrong. Yeah, the answer is yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, first it's fuck you and then it's yes. (laughs) But I agree with you. Yeah. And so I think that probably, and we, we haven't asked anybody this in, in any of the poll questions, but I think our experiences, the um, anecdotes that Caden and I have shared with each other and the results that we got about the questions that we did ask, I think that a lot of the, um, the, the responses that we've gotten have been because faculty and program um, directors and directors of graduate studies and, and chairs and whatever, all these uh, people don't want to make this change because they think the rigor Mm. is the important thing and that we can't have like, we, uh, uh, we can't be good grad students and good scientists if we're not um, miserable and tired and overworked. And if we don't do it in exactly this one way and, and, and uh, one of the uh, polls that we ran, I think we got an N of 59 participants. And so the question that we asked, if I can find it here. Okay. If the, the, the disability office approved you accommodations. Have you ever had a professor fail to provide your accommodations? And we had 59 people answer. And out of those 59, 80% answered yes. And so these are students who had accommodations approved by the office and a professor was basically just like, no. Grad students. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we specifically required it to only be grad students. Fair enough. I mean, it's bad either way. Yes. But I just thought I would check <laughs> in. Uh, but yeah, no, that's disgusting. Back to my word. Uh, gross. <laughs> and maybe this is a really radical opinion, but maybe not. My reaction to that is that that is illegal. Like that is discrimination legally. Yes. Okay. I was like, that's illegal. Okay. Just wanted to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Totally illegal. illegal. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Okay. But I mean, that's part of it. And I don't 
think that we've gotten to ask this poll question. Actually, maybe we asked it um, about like what, like, is there a grievance procedure for if uh, a professor? You know, there's not neglects. <laughs> Sometimes there are, and they're, and, and they're nothing. I, I mean, it's basically you just, like, write an email and complain. But, yeah, there are, there are no consequences, right? That's one of the challenging parts about tenure, is that tenure, once a professor has gotten tenure, they can now do whatever they want. And while that's great for, like, academic freedom and getting to ask the kinds of research questions that you want, if a person is consistently not providing accommodations – they should be reprimanded slash fired. breaking the law. You know, it, it makes me think like, hey, it's Alana from the future again. Right around this time, I got back on my soapbox about things being illegal, but I didn't really know what I was talking about, nor did I really include any of this in my outline with Kate and Caden. So none of us were prepared to discuss the law. And instead, I'm going to skip over this minute and a half of group confusion. And instead, you can find more information about the legal rights of disabled college students in the link listed in the show notes. Okay, back to the episode. It kind of, well, first things first, the blog post you wrote that you mentioned back a couple minutes ago, totally going to link that for the episode. I love that. If you have any more blog, like I'm ready. I love blog posts, ready to link them. (laughs) But it also made me think, you know, the only comparison that I can draw, and I know that you guys have the disability services office at most, all universities. I say most because some are more active than others. But the only comparison I can draw is because I'm Jewish, there are some holidays that fall on weekdays. Mm -hmm. And I had a professor who had an organic chemistry exam on Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish holiday where we fast, can't drink or eat all day. Um, Although I will say my personal opinion, Judaism is really good about like, if you can't fast, here's what you can do instead. That's like on a health measure, very, whatever, not getting into it, but like makes me really (laughs) proud. Um, There's a lot of disabled (laughs) rabbis that I follow on Twitter who talk Ah. a lot about that intersectionality. Anyways, off topic, but I basically told the rabbi at my university, this person is having an exam this day. And when I told them about it, they were like, uh, it's not a university holiday. And I was like, so this is like, this is a religious like exemption. Like you have to move it for me. And the rabbi like went to that person's office with me and was like, hello, this is illegal (laughs) and made them accommodate me. And I don't know if there is anyone to go to bat for you. I mean, I'm sure, like you said, the disability resource office, maybe they send an email. What happens what does happen on your end? That, like, if things aren't accommodated, what do students have the option to do other than send an email for accommodations and then wait for the professor to maybe give a shit about it or not or ignore it because they can, because no one's holding them accountable? It varies so widely by university and even within university in terms of, yeah, how active your office is, how many students are on their caseload, because a lot of times these are very small, underfunded offices that serve a lot of people. Sometimes disability service offices are run by disabled people. At my undergrad, for a long time, the director was disabled. Mm. Um, that's definitely not, I, w- I don't even know how I would call that common. can also just depend on biases held by who's in the office. So, like, I had prof- disability service office employees go to bat for me in undergrad. And I'm sure that that was facilitated by the fact that I was relatively quiet, considered well-spoken in terms of like neurotypical norms that I was a white person. And if I had held other marginalized identities, I I don't think I would be confident in saying that I would have had the same support behind me. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's important. Well, and, and I think part of it is if your accommodation is one that you walk into the room and they're either giving you the accommodation or not, you have to decide, okay, they're not going to give me the extra 20 minutes uh, because for example, if you get extra time on an exam and you find out that they're not going to give you the extra 20 minutes, do you just go in and take the exam? Or do you not take the exam and take a zero on the hopes that you're going to get an appeal with the accommodations office, right? In that instance, you can't write an email and wait, you have to make a choice in the moment. Um, and that's a lot of added stress. It's a lot of added uh, labor for a student to have to advocate for them, themselves to maybe take an exam, knowing that they don't have as much time as they are legally offered. And so like in the back of their mind, while they're taking the exam, they're worried like, oh, I don't have enough time. Oh no. And so that's going to impact their performance on the exam. And 
they can always go to the um, disability services office afterward and potentially appeal. But now the professor might argue that, well, they've already seen the exam and so they can't go back and take it again and they're not going to write another one. And so there are all these sort of like in the moment Mm. choices that are, are being made. And then all the extra labor, I mean, we, 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 did a poll on that too. Yes. Give me the, um, I love these polls. I'm literally <laughs> I'm obsessed with this. I love it. I mean, so like, I love polls also, which is why I was like, every day we have to do a poll. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. This reminds me, I should probably do a poll for the podcast. But anyways, I love, I'm Ooh. a big poll fan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If an accommodation was not provided, how long did you spend advocating for the accommodation or stressing over the lack of accommodation. And again, we, we didn't um, ex- we, we, uh, we, we didn't differentiate between undergrads and grad sure, students, sure. but more than 60% of respondents said that they spent months advocating or stressing over a lack of accommodation. <laughs> Sorry for anyone listening who didn't just see my like visceral reaction to that. So I was going to guess before you said anything. So I made a guess in my head and I was like, oh, like maybe three hours. <laughs> that was the number that came to mind of like, yeah, a couple hours, probably Mo- months. And that came up when Kate and I were sort of creating the polls when we were yep. deciding what's, what's the time scale of the answer choice is going to be. And and I, th- I, it was my suggestion that I was like, oh, you know, hours, weeks, months. And Kate was like, whoa, I was thinking, you know, on a time scale of somewhere between, you know, like hours and maybe like a day or something like that. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we ended up going with the time scale that we did, because apparently it was for a lot of people months that they spent advocating and or worried about this. I think you made a podcast host speechless. <laughs> wow. Give me some more polls. I think that this is so eye-opening <laughs> on I mean like true and it sounds like even for you guys you know when we talk too about like the diversity of identities that may intersect along with disabilities or just the diversity of disabilities themselves like like you said we don't really have any idea who this is impacting how it is impacting them how it's holding them back so I love that you have some numbers on these are there any others that really stood out to you that that you think are like really valuable to talk about here. I mean, I'm sure there are, but what are some of them? Well, I think the one that is personally the, the I guess the closest one to my experience and that I really wanted to have as a poll was if you have ever considered taking a leave of absence from grad school due to disability, chronic illness, or mental health, did your ability to pay for healthcare factor into your decision. And so here we had a slightly lower end. It was only 27, but a little over 10% said, no, it didn't factor in. Um, a little over 15% said yes. And I took leave and then wait a second, the math on this poll looks a little funny. Am I right? Yeah, Kaden? the math looks a little funny on this. We need to hold on a second. We have yeah. to recrunch that number. I redid the math on that poll. If you're on the oh. polls page, Kate, I don't know if you are. I love how organized um, you guys are. The polls page. I'm like living for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should, All right. We, should we jump back in then? Ah, the end of part one. What a cliffhanger. Will you ever find out the result of that poll? I guess you'll have to wait until Thursday to find out. You can find this week's guests on Twitter at DisInGradSchool. That's D I S. I-N-G-R-A-D-S-C-H-O-O-L or on their personal pages for Kate at Kate S. Kirby. That's C-A-I-T-S-K-I-R-B-Y and Kaden at Kaden Stockwell and that's K-A-Y-D-E-N-S-T-O-C-K-W E-L-L. If you want more Dear Grad Student, you can find the podcast on social media. You can find the podcast on Twitter at Dear Grad Student, on Instagram at Dear Grad Student Pod, and on YouTube by searching Dear Grad Student Podcast. If you just want to connect with me online, you can find me on Twitter at Alana underscore Gloger. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore G-L-O-G-E-R. 
And if you like what you heard in the podcast today, catch up on all your missed episodes. December is the perfect time, things are relaxed, you don't have as much assignments, and send your favorite episode to a friend. Word of mouth really, really helps a podcast out. And if you can, please rate and leave a review for Dear Grad Student on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or you know, wherever you find your other favorite shows. Reminder that all of the resources and links that we mentioned in today's episode can be found in the description. And until next time, warmest regards, best wishes, sincerely, Alana. <laughs>